So continuing our journey in chapter 11, we're going to start talking about colligative properties. And we've actually partitioned this into two parts. And so here's the learning goals slash outcomes, expectations for colligative properties. And this is actually for both part one and part two. Part one will be this video. Part two will be the next video. It'll be partitioned into two class periods. But it didn't make sense to uh, partition the learning outcomes and expectations. So this is for both of those um, lecture periods. All right, so section 11.4, since we're skipping over colloids, colligative properties is the last thing we'll cover in chapter 11. So we've gone from dissolution process and nomenclature to talking about electrolytes versus non-electrolytes, then talking about solubility, rules that dictate solubility, as well as the temperature and pressure relationships to solubility. And now we're gonna go with colligative properties. And so this is actually a pretty big section. And so we're gonna partition it into Van T Hoff factor, which is a parameter that dictates colligative property outcomes, as well as the properties that are actually changed by colligative properties. And so in chapter 10, we talked about intermolecular forces, right? We talked about how molecules interact with each other through dipole-dipole through intermolecular forces and how this dictates viscosity, vapor pressure of pure substances. Uh, and then chapter 11, we started to talk about like dissolves like and how these intermolecular forces dictate things like solubility. Now, when we go to chapter 11 or section 11.4, we're going to talk about colligative properties. And colligative properties are weird compared to everything else we've talked about because it's only dependent on the number of solute particles and not upon their identity or interaction. And so for colligative properties, there are a specific list of properties that aren't dictated by intermolecular forces at all. In fact, it doesn't matter what the intermolecular forces are. All that matters is the number of particles in solution. And so later we'll talk about thermodynamics. Basically, intermolecular forces are driven by enthalpy. Colligative properties have an entropic contribution to them. And so it's dictated by the number of particles, and uh, that is what changes its properties. And so here's the four colligative properties, at least the four primary ones that I know of and the ones that the book covers. And so one is vapor pressure lower lowering, two is boiling point elevation, three is freezing point depression, and then four is osmotic pressure. And so again, this, these colligative properties are weird because they only depend on the number of particles that go into, into the solution and not on the identity or the intermolecular forces between them. And so the more particles you put in, the bigger the impact on the colligative properties. And so if you take a pure liquid of some kind and we'll say it's, it's a solvent, it doesn't matter what that solvent is, but that solvent is going to have a vapor pressure. And so you're going to add some solute molecules to that and it's going to change the properties. And that's what colligative properties are. That's the, the, the solute molecules change the properties. And so you add more, there's a larger change, add a different solute. Uh, turns out it doesn't matter as long as the number of particles are the same, you get the same property change. And that's, that's really unusual since we spent a lot of time talking about intermolecular forces. Colligative properties don't care about the nature of the molecule, only the number of molecules in that solution. And so again, it doesn't matter if they're red or blue, it doesn't matter if it's ethanol or, or glucose, it's just dependent on the uh, number of particles in the solution. And so here again is our list, vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, freezing point Point depression and osmotic pressure and these are the equations that essentially describe the magnitude of the change or the impact of the um, particles on the properties that we're discussing. And so since this is such a long section, we've actually partitioned it into two. Today we're going to cover part one, or in this video we're going to cover part one, and then the next video you guys will see part two, and so that'll, that'll be covered in subsequent video. And so regardless of what we're covering now, colligative properties, again, it's only dependent on the number of solute particles. And so we talked about electrolytes versus non-electrolytes in, in a previous video. Uh, the important thing here to know about electrolytes versus non-electrolytes is that this changes the number of particles in solution. And so what I mean by that is if I add glucose, it stays as glucose. One glucose turns into one glucose. However, if I add one unit of sodium chloride, it turns into two things. And so this idea of electrolytes becomes very, very important in colligative properties because it's, again, dictated by the number of particles in solution. Not the number of units I start with, but by the number of particles that are in solution. And so let's take sucrose, for example. It's just another sugar molecule. It's very similar to glucose. You put that in solution. You have one mole of it. You end up with one mole of particles. Similarly, you put methanol or ethanol in solution. One mole of methanol gives you one particle of methanol. 
Those are non-electrolyte species, so they don't break apart, they don't give individual components, they stay as a single component species. But you take things like salts, like sodium chloride, iron chloride, potassium sulfate, um, sodium phosphate, these are salts, and they're going to break apart in solution, and so these are electrolyte species. And so with sodium chloride, you're putting NaCl, we'll say one mole of that in, you end up with two moles of particles because it breaks up into sodium chloride. Iron chloride, you end up with four particles. Potassium sulfate, you have three particles. Uh, sodium phosphate, you have four particles because it breaks up into PO4 minus and Na3 plus three of those species. And so when we talk about colligative properties, we basically need to take into account these electrolyte species that start out as one thing and break into multiple things. So sodium chloride breaks into two, iron chloride breaks into four. And so what we have is something called a Van't Hoff factor. It's basically number of particles in a solution after dissociation over number of formula units that were initially dissolved in solution. And so simply put, this, this number, this I, is like a mathematical fudge factor that says, I put in one, but I got two out, or I put in one and I got four out. And so the I value for these, for non-electrolytes, it's one. For electrolytes that break into two, it's two. For iron chloride that breaks into four, it's four. And so basically this is a scalar that says the initial concentration is not the real concentration. I need to multiply it by this parameter to tell you the true number of those particles. And one thing to note about this is this, this isn't, it depends on how much it dissociates and this is not the exact number. Um, but for the sake of general chemistry, uh, two, this is the parameter we're going to use. We're going to say it's going to break into two, four, three, four, so on and so forth, depending on how many uh, individual units it breaks into. And so for all these colligative properties, we'll go through each one of these individually, but you'll find that Van't Hoff, that basically um, concentration fudge factor in these calculations. And so this, this mole fraction or molality or molarity, this gives you the concentration of the thing you initially put in. This I acts as a scalar to basically multiply it by how many particles are actually generated. And so hopefully this makes more sense as we go into these individual cases. And so again, using sodium chloride as an example, if you put um, two molality sodium chloride in solution, you're not just getting two molality of things, you're breaking it up into two molality of sodium, two molality of chloride, which gives you an I of Van't Hoff factor of two. And so what you're effectively ending up with is this I times, so we'll go to this equation here, I is the two scalar because you're making two particles, M is the molality, the true molality is I times M which gives you four molality. And so when you start with two molality, if this has Van't Hoff factor of two, it gives you four molality. And so that's necessary because it's dependent on the number of particles and that's what you're calculating when you multiply I times M or I times uh, Xi1 or I times molarity here. And so again, <coughs> looking at this for exa actual examples, uh, three molality glucose, you have three molecules, three molality of uh, sodium chloride, you're actually ending up with six, and three of calcium chloride, you're ending up with nine. And it's because the I, the Van't Hoff factor is one, two, it breaks into two, three, because it breaks into three. And so the real concentration here is three, because that's where it started and it only broke into one, it didn't break up in anything. The sodium chloride breaks into two, so you double the concentration, and then calcium chloride breaks into three, so it's three times the concentration. And so in terms of impact on colligative properties, you have pure water, which has or pure solvent, which has a certain set of properties, you add three molality glucose, it's gonna change those properties. Adding three molality sodium chloride, it's gonna change it more. Three molality of calcium chloride changes it even more because there's gonna be more particles from this than there is from this, than there is from this, than there is from the pure substance. And so this, this Van't Hoff factor is a scalar to take that into account. All right, so diving into the actual colligative properties, and you'll notice that Van't Hoff factor is in each of these equations, but we're gonna first talk about vapor pressure lowering. And so we talked about it previously where if you have a solvent in a closed container, there's going to be a vapor pressure, right? There's going to be some kinetic energy associated with these molecules. Some of them are going to escape. Some of them are going to go back in. You'll reach an equilibrium condition where there's a vapor pressure of that solvent. And so we call this p naught or the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Now, if we add solute molecules to the solution, 
it changes that vapor pressure. And this is what it means to be a colligative property. It basically says every solute molecule you add to the solution, it decreases the number of molecules in the vapor phase. And so what you're effectively seeing is the vapor pressure goes down as you add solute molecules to the solution. And so it'll always decrease whenever you add solute molecules. The more solute molecules you add, the more that vapor pressure goes down. And so the, the P, the pressure of the solution after you add solute, is going to be lower than the initial pressure. And so note that we're talking about um, non-volatile solute molecules. So basically they're not going to go into the gas phase. We're going to assume they're going to largely stay in the liquid here. And so again, vapor pressure lowering is exactly what it sounds like. You add solute molecules to the solution, it decreases the vapor pressure in the headspace above that solution um, based on this impact by colligative properties. And so you can envision this on a molecular level. You could say, you know, if you have 100% pure solvent, there's a bunch of molecules going to the gas phase. If you add, say, you know, an equal molar concentration of solute and you have 50% solvent, 50% solute, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lower the amount of molecules that go into the gas phase. In fact, it lowers it by half. And so it's directly proportional to the concentration ratio associated with it. And so one way to think about this is maybe you only have half the solvent molecules on the surface that are capable of escaping, and the solute molecules are basically blocking that behavior. And so what you talk about when you do uh, vapor pressure lowering calculation is a mole fraction of solvent. So it's basically the amount of solvent per the total moles of everything, solvent plus solute, and you can plug that into the equation. And so in this case, the mole fraction of solvent when it's 100% pure is 1. When you have 50% solute, the mole fraction of solvent goes to 0 0.5. And so Again, we have this, this uh, proportionality between the uh, mole fraction of solvent and the uh, concentration of solution, and that's dictated by how many solute molecules. And so that changes this mole fraction of solvent, and it'll, um, it'll change the vapor pressure of that solution. And so here's the actual equation that you use to calculate that. And so you have P0, which we talked about earlier. This is the vapor pressure of a pure solvent. You have this uh, chi1, which is the mole fraction of uh, solvent in the solution. And then you have I, the Van Hoff factor. And multiplying these guys together gives you the pressure of the solution after you've added those solute molecules. And so if this uh, your Van Hoff factor is 1 and your um, solvent mole ratio is 1, then the, the, the pressure is equal. But anytime you add solute, this number decreases. And so effectively, adding moles of solute makes this, the denominator, bigger, which makes this number smaller. If this number is smaller, then this number goes down. And so it's proportional. As soon as you add solute molecules, chi1 decreases, which means that uh, P1 is going to decrease as well. And so that's exactly what we're seeing. And so that's where the vapor pressure lowering comes from. As you add solute, this number gets smaller, which means the P1 gets smaller, the vapor pressure is lowered. And so again, the more you add, the more you lower the vapor pressure. You keep adding, this number keeps getting smaller, this number keeps getting smaller to a threshold where your solute is no longer soluble. And so again, for pure solvent, this chi one is equal to this chi one is equal to one, which means your pressure um, of the pure solvent is equal to the pressure after the calculation. That makes sense. And then any solute you add decreases that number proportionally. All right, so one natural byproduct of that uh, vapor pressure lowering is actually boiling point elevation. And so in 10.3, we talked about vapor pressure and how it relates to boiling point, right? Vapor pressure is just intrinsic to the solution at a given temperature. But when you have an open container, you have that vapor pressure going against the external pressure. And so what ends up happening is as soon as the external pressure and the vapor pressure are equal, you have boiling of your, of your solution. And so again, your external pressure dictates what the boiling point of that solution is. And so this has implications in terms of the boiling point um, and re with respect to colligative properties, right? Because we already know this calculation that the mole fraction of solvent dictates the vapor pressure of the solution, right? Here's your pure solvent. You have some mole fraction of solvent. You have Van Hoff factor. And the more solute you add, the more this goes down, the more this number decreases. And so what that effectively tells you is you're adding solute 
mole fraction of solvent goes down, uh, the vapor pressure of that solution decreases. And so what this does is effectively shift your, um, your vapor pressure temperature relationship curve. And so this goes back to a graph we saw earlier. Here's temperature, here's vapor pressure. You can see here's the pure solvent. When you add any solute, you effectively lower this curve down. And so at any given time, you're going to lower the vapor pressure, which is effectively going to shift when you reach the boiling point. And so under one atmosphere conditions, basically you have to get up to a temperature where this uh, vapor pressure line intersects um, with the atmospheric pressure, which in uh, under normal conditions is 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 torr or one atmosphere. And so that's the boiling point of the pure solvent. Then you add those solute molecules, it actually decreases the vapor cur pressure curve. And so what you have to do is actually heat the solution up more so it can get to this vapor pressure where it can compete. Remember, we have vapor pressure lowering, which essentially means the curve goes down. So we have to heat the solution up even more to get that vapor pressure to match atmospheric pressure. And so that's where this, this uh, uh, boiling point elevation comes from. And so you have vapor pressure lowering, which means you have to heat it up even more to get the va vapor pressure to equal the external pressure. And that's where the boiling point elevation comes from. And so as you add solute, mole fraction of solvent goes down, vapor pressure goes down, which means your boiling point increases. You have to heat it up more to get that vapor pressure to overcome external pressure. And so that's it. That's where boiling point elevation comes from. So it's a byproduct of this vapor pressure lowering as you add sol solute molecules. And so, so there's an equation associated with it. It's basically here is the change in temperature. So it's basically the difference of the, the boiling point of the pure substance to the uh, solution where you've added solute molecules to it. And it's equal to the Van't Hoff factor times the boiling point elevation constant. So this number is a constant depending on what the solution is. And then you're gonna multiply that the molality of the solution. So the moles of solute per kilograms of solvent. And so that's gonna give you what that change in temperature is. And so this is the numerical way to show that um, when you add solute molecules um, uh, when you add sol uh, solute molecules this number is going to get bigger and so the temperature change is going to get bigger and so there's a proportionality adding solute lowers the vapor pressure you need to heat it up more to get that to the boiling point which means that boiling point is going to be higher and that change in boiling point is going to be dictated by that concentration of solute molecules and so um, a few things to note, this KB, it's a constant, it depends on the solvent, so if you're doing water versus hexane versus dichloromethane, it's going to give you a different number. The molality is dictated by the concentration of solute, and so you have to know the nature of the solvent plus the uh, concentration of the solute molecules, and so you're going to do a molality calculation. All right, so that closes out our first half of colligative properties. And so to summarize, colligative properties are dependent on the number of particles in solution. When you do electrolytes versus non-electrolytes, you're changing that number of particles, and you have to take that into account using the Van't Hoff factor. Um, <coughs> The vapor pressure of the solvent decreases as you add solute molecules. That's where the vapor pressure lowering comes from. That vapor pressure dictates where your boiling point is going to be. And so it's going to take more energy as you add solute molecules. It takes, you have to put more heat. You have to increase the temperature more to have that vapor pressure match external pressure, which is where the boiling point elevation comes from. And so in both cases, it's number of particles dictating those properties. Adding more particles lowers the vapor pressure. Adding more particles raises the boiling point of the solution. All right, so that closes out part one of colligative properties. So we have the Van't Hoff factor, vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation. In the next video, we'll talk about freezing point, depression, and osmotic pressure, which are the other two colligative properties we'll be discussing.